Today's workshop is about the special collections at Savannah State University and how to explore university history through our archives. In today's presentation, I'm going to go over the history of the special collections, some history facts about the university, notable collections within our archives, some of the treasures of the collection, how to visit, and also how to use our digital resources. My name is Jennifer West. I'm the Technical Services Lead Librarian here at Gordon Library, and that also means I am responsible for the special collections. So the Savannah State Archives were established in 1990 to celebrate the centennial of the school. A committee visited Philadelphia, where the first college president, Major Richard R. Wright Sr.'s family lived, and they graciously donated papers, artifacts, and items to provide a really robust collection of our first president. You can see his picture on the left. In fact, we have some of his collection available in our Tiger Scholar Commons digital repository. I'll be doing a demonstration of how to access that later. So the, our special collections are located now on the second floor of the Asa H. Gordon Library. You can see the boxes that we store things like photographs, documents related to the college, yearbooks, newspapers. We have a collection for each college president, except for our current one. And um, we also have collections related to notable alumni. And finally, we have realia, or physical objects, of his historical significance to the university. If you're interested in Savannah State University's history, uh, we have two books written by people well-connected to the college um, that both are worth taking a look at. The first one was written for the centennial, 100 Years of Educating at Savannah State College, 1890-1990 by Dr. Clyde W. Hall. It is available in print at the library and then we are really fortunate that Dr. Hall gave permission for it to be available as a PDF download in our Tiger Scholar Commons digital repository. That URL at the bottom of the screen is where you can find it, but I'll also show you how to search for it. 25 years later, Dr. Charles J. Elmore, Sr. wrote an updated version at the request of President Cheryl Davenport Dozier um, for the 125th celebration of Savannah State. His book, Tell Them We Are Rising, the History of Savannah State University, 1890 to 2015, is available in print and soon will be also available for um, free download in Tiger Scholar Commons because Dr. Elmore has also given his permission for us to include that in our repository. Both of these books provide a detailed description of each presidency starting with um, Major Richard R. Wright and then going up through 1990 and then 2015. So one of the most notable facts about Savannah State is that it is the oldest public HBCU in Georgia. In 1862, Congress passed a Federal Land Grant Act that gave federal land to states, which they could then sell to fund public colleges. The University of Georgia, although it was established in 1785, was the state's first land-grant institution when it got public funding post-Civil War. In 1890, the federal government, Congress, passed another land-grant act, Expansion, uh, which required states to show that race was not an admissions criteria or else establish separate institutions for black Americans. So this helped establish several HBCUs, including Savannah State. Um, it was founded in 1890 by a act by the Georgia Assembly 
to establish a school for colored students. Um, that's the language of the act um, associated with University of Georgia. So its first year was uh, held in Athens, uh, but then other parts of Georgia were competing for the location of this first uh, land grant HBCU. Augusta, Americus, Macon, Columbus, and Savannah were all in a competition. So ministers of Savannah's prominent black churches, like the Reverend Alex Alexander Harris of Second Bryan Baptist Church and Reverend E.K. Love of First African Baptist Church, formed a committee uh, to promote establishing the land-grant school here in Savannah. They held public meetings in the black community, and they put together an offer to the state. Um, they raised money, and they included a donation of land near the Vernon River that Savannah State sits on today. The land given for the Georgia State Industrial College for Colored Youth was originally part of Placentia Plantation. In this photo, you can see the antebellum mansion that was on part of the land. Two white landowners, George Parsons and Sarah Postel, deeded two separate plots of land for the school. This mansion was called the George Parsons Mansion. In fact, the first building that was built on campus was named after George Parsons. Parsons Hall was first a dorm for male students, then became a dorm for female students and faculty, as well as the post office. It was demolished in the 1950s. It's where the swimming pool currently sits. There is a history of enslaved people here on this land. Uh, Placentia Plantation was a working plantation that was started in the early 1800s. There have been at uh, times investigations to see if there were burials of enslaved people on the land. Uh, no burial sites have been found, but there is a memorial garden um, not too far outside the library to honor those that were forced to work this land well before it became a place of education for black Georgians. Our first president, Richard R. Wright Sr., um, was well known within the education circles of the time. He corresponded with Booker T. Washington regularly. In fact, we have letters um, from Booker T. Washington in our uh, Richard R. Wright Sr. collection. He was president um, here in Savannah from 1891 to 1921. The school started with eight students and it had different levels of schooling. It had college, what we think of um, as a today as college. It had normal school, which is like a college prep curriculum for high school level students and then a subnormal curriculum. It had a strong focus on agriculture. It started as a working farm. Part of being a land-grant institution is that it was to educate people in agriculture. So there were programs in practical agriculture, poultry raising, and dairying. On the right side of this page, you can see what is one of the first annual reports uh, written by hand by Major Wright. This video is going to talk about another artifact that we have of Major Wright's. That we have. We have the cane of our first president, Major Richard R. Wright. This was donated to us back in 1990, along with the other original pictures, manuscripts, and his. we have also documents with his original handwriting. And just to show you, we have to add to this an actual picture of Major Richard R. Wright with that cane in his hand. Major Wright went on to Philadelphia after his tenure as president here and 
became a banker. And um, in fact, if you visit the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, part of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., you will see Major Richard R. Wright's portrait hanging on the third floor in an exhibition called The Power of Place. Part of that exhibition shows May Reeves Millinery from Philadelphia. Um, it is a recreation of May Reeves Hat Shop where she created hats and Major Wright was the banker who provided her the loan that made it possible for her to have a business. She was so grateful to Major Wright that she kept his photograph in her shop. This photo is the graduating class of 1900. You can see Major Wright second from the left on the first row. Not a very large class. Hill Hall is one of the more well-known buildings on campus. It was built uh, between 1900 and 1901. Because the land-grant status required both agriculture and mechanics, the industrial department was founded in 1892, which included masonry, blacksmithing, painting, tailoring, shoemaking, carpentry, wheel riding. These were all trades that were taught at Georgia State Industrial College. So when Hill Hall was constructed, it was a project by students and faculty of the industrial department. Students would generally spend about half a day on academics and then half a day on one of these trades or agriculture. Women were admitted in 1898, although they were not allowed to live on campus for a while. Um, just as men were expected to study trades, women spent half their day in the domestic science department, um, which started with sewing and dressmaking and cooking. It, the Department of Home Economics continued for a number of years. The photo on this slide is of Dr. Teresa Anthony from the late 1970s. We have a number of um, objects from the Department of Home Economics as well as some really interesting books in our library collection that were there to support that department. Some more notable collections of our um, special collections we have yearbooks. Uh, the first published yearbook was in 1939, and it's, it was titled The Hubertonian. In the 1940s, the name switched to The Tiger, and there were yearbooks published almost every year until 1998. We don't have every year that was published available um, either in the special collections or digitized, but we're close. Um, so you can come and flip through physical copies by making an appointment for the special collections or you can take a look at them through Tiger Scholar Commons and the Internet Archive. I'll do a demonstration of both of those in a minute. We also have the school's newspapers. Um, the Tiger's Roar is what it, the paper has been known as for most of its uh, time. It also got started in the late 1930s. What we have digitized is late 1940s through the 1970s, um, available through Tiger Scholar Commons and the Internet Archive. We have more issues of the newspapers available in physical form in the archives and one goal is to get those digitized so that we can have as complete a run of the Tiger's Roar as possible. College bulletins and catalogs um, have been digitized as well and you can see um, that we have them on the shelves in the special collections too. It's interesting to go through them and see how the curriculum has changed over the years, to see how rules and regulations from different time periods have changed. You know, the rules about when men and women could be in the dorms of the opposite gender um, were very strict for a while. And it, so you can see how social norms change just by taking a look at the catalog. 
we do have these again uh, in digital form as well as physical form for many years. The Southern Regional Press Institute is a, an event at, held annually since about 1950, uh, continues to today, and it was developed to give high school and college students experience in communications and journalism. Um, the journalism program was actually funded by the Wall Street Journal Education Fund, um, and so this is was part of it, and it's definitely grown over the years. You can see in the upper corner an issue or the front page of the Pacemaker newspaper, which is something that was put out by the students during the um, Southern Regional Press Institute. We have an extensive collection of programs and photographs um, and many notable people in journalism have come to Savannah State for the Southern Regional Press Institute over the years. We also have some collections that are specific to civil rights in Savannah and on campus. Um, scrapbooks were a way that information was collected for a number of years and there were scrapbooks collected possibly by the library staff of both Savannah events and national events. Um, so we have several dozen that cover a number of years. Um, you can see in these three photos uh, some of the different things that we have in our collection. The far left is a photo of um, Otis Johnson, former mayor of Savannah, former professor here at Savannah State, and he was also a scholar in residence until 2019. Um, he started his college career at Savannah State, but he was um, active in integrating Armstrong State College when uh, desegregation happened. So he actually ended up being a graduate of Armstrong, um, but certainly has strong ties to Savannah State. Uh, the center photo is of Bobby Hill. He was a student leader in a 1963 student uprising that started because of the firing of a faculty member. And Bobby Hill went on to be the first African American elected to the Georgia House since Reconstruction. On the right, you can see a page from one of the Savannah scrapbooks. It's a Savannah Morning News article from March 17, 1960, about Savannah State students involved in a um, sit-down at Levy's department store, where they got arrested because um, that was illegal at the time. So through these scrapbooks and photographs, and then also looking at the yearbooks and the uh, Tiger's War uh, student newspapers through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you can get a really interesting picture of what students were doing on campus as it relates to civil rights and, as this Savannah Morning News article shows, off campus as well. As we have an extensive homecoming collection, um, we have a photo collection of the homecoming queens and during alumni weekend uh, the special collections um, usually helps with an event honoring the 25th and the 50th anniversary homecoming court. In these pictures you can see the crowning of the 1948-49 queen from a yearbook. The middle photo is a picture of former mayor Edna Jackson when she was a student here riding in the homecoming parade 1973-1974 uh, and then the far right photo is when um, Edna Jackson during her time as alderman at large was the parade marshal in one of the Savannah State homecoming parades. We have photo collections that cover athletics, campus life, buildings, just a whole range of subjects. And here you can see three examples. One of um, 
two uh, young ladies just spending time on the grass, uh, one of a formal event, and then the school mascot. Um, and so if you have a specific topic that you're interested in, uh, it's very possible that we have a photo collection that matches that. I mentioned realia earlier, the objects, the three-dimensional objects that are part of our collection. We have uh, some scientific equipment like the microscope on the left. We have different uniforms from the band and cheerleaders over the years. And on the far right is an example of one of the pieces of equipment used in the home economics program. That actually is a washing machine from the 1940s. Here is another video with Ms. Ogden showing another treasure of our collection. I have a few artifacts here that I would like to share with you. Um, this is an Olympics costume that was donated to us by one of our former professors here that took a group of students to Atlanta in 1996 to perform at the opening and closing ceremonies. Uh, it was called Call to Nations, and that was Miss Loris Boyd Jordan that gave us this fabulous costume. Just to give you a little better view, that's the mask. And actually, here we go, that's, this is even better. She actually put the costume on for us. Oh, and there along with the mask. So this is a really priceless artifact that was given to us that would be allowed for people to be able to come in and see. So we do have a spot on the internet where you can get more information about the special collections and also where you can access the digital part of our collections. So this is our special collections website and it has basic information about how to visit. Right now things are available by appointment only. There are times where we are able to have um, the special collections open during certain hours, so it's good to check this page or give the library a call. A 912-358-4324 uh, is the circulation desk. The digital collections tab here is how you can access both the Internet Archive and Tiger Scholar Commons. So I'm going to start by clicking on Digital Archives. And this is how you can see what's on the Internet Archive. This was a project done uh, several years ago where many things were digitized. College catalogs, um, bound volumes of newspapers, yearbooks, um, and so down here you can see some of the subject headings. So if you were interested in seeing the college yearbooks, you can click on this and it will take you straight to the Internet Archive with all of the Savannah State yearbooks listed. You can see here this one is from 1947. It was still called the Hubertonian. And if you wanted to look at a specific year, on this left side, under Year, click More, and it will bring up all the years that we have available. As you can see, the first one is 1939, and we're missing a few. Um, during, the, during World War II, there wasn't an issue published every year, um, but then it becomes pretty much an annual thing for several decades, and then the last time that there was a yearbook published was 1998. So if you wanted to check out say the 1970 yearbook you can click that and then click apply your filters and it brings up the 1970 yearbook. So you can click either on the image or on the title and this is a really nice way to browse through the yearbook. 
you can page through it like this. You've got options to zoom in or zoom out. You also can search the text. So if you were looking for someone specific, you can put their name in. I'm interested to see if Dr. Calvin Kaya is in this yearbook anywhere. So that looks like there are two instances of his name appearing in text. If I click here, it'll take me to the first one. This is under uh, the administration. He was dean of faculty. That's his picture right there. And then if I want to see the second one, I could either click the arrow here or click on where it says page 279. And this one actually takes me to his name in the index. Not every issue has an index, especially not some of the early ones. So um, having this search feature is really nice if you're looking for a specific name. So if we go back, I mentioned we've got newspapers, we've got the catalogs, or also known as the bulletins, um, commencement programs, uh, so the um, graduation programs. Under research, these are volumes of faculty research um, that were published in the I believe the 50s through the 70s. Yes, 1954 to 1974 is what we have digitized. So that's the digital archives and I like that um, setup because it's very easy to browse through books. Tiger Scholar Commons is our more updated um, online repository but it's not as user-friendly when it comes to books at least not yet. We're getting there. If you want to see the special collections, you click on the Library Special Collections Community, and then you can see our major collections. Um, we have Major Richard R. Wright Sr., Southern Regional Press Institute, the University Catalogs, Commencement Programs, Newspapers, Yearbooks, and then also an Historic Photograph Collection. Um, so to look for a yearbook, you can click on the yearbook here and then do a search within the collection. So I want to search 1970 and here it is right here, 1970. Click on that and it's going to bring up the same cover image. What's different about this is that you can download as a PDF the entire document um, to your computer. So that's a little time consuming and so it means you have to download it first before you can look at it. Um, I'm hoping that we are able to improve this so that you're able to browse just like you can with the Internet Archive. But this is, um, we are likely to have more years of the university yearbooks in Tiger Scholar Commons than Internet Archive. So if you don't find a year in the Internet Archive, check in Tiger Scholar Commons as well. Going back to the special collections, we have the Historic Photograph Collection. And not, uh, these are still things that are being built slowly. Um, but campus buildings are pretty well represented. And you can see um, the different uh, titles are related to um, which building it is. Um, like Hurdy Hall was recently renovated. And so this image is of a, um, there, that's the older picture of it. So you can uh, search in this uh, using the search box. Um, you can also browse through the different collections. And if at any point you're trying to find something online and you're not sure if it's there, uh, 
definitely feel free to contact me. I'm uh, more than happy to help with any sort of uh, information needs that you might have. So that's our online space. If you wanted to come and visit the special collections, as I mentioned right now, you need an appointment. Um, you can email specialcollections at savannastate.edu to set up an appointment, or you can send me an email directly, westj at savannastate.edu. When you visit an archives, it's not quite like visiting just the library. We have some special procedures that we ask people to follow so that we can protect our documents. Um, you, we, you would be asked to fill out a researcher form. Um, you're asked to leave any bags in a locker or on the desk there in the special collections reading room. Pencils only for note taking. We provide pencils. Uh, we also can provide paper. If there are photographs that have not been put into sleeves, we'll ask that you wear special gloves for handling those. And if you need copies or want to take photos of anything, we ask that you um, consult with us first before taking pictures or um, and as far as making copies, staff would make the copies for you. We can also provide scans of things, um, and it's uh, d we have different uh, levels of scans available. So I just encourage you to come visit the special collections. Uh, we have treasures in these boxes, and I'm always excited to help somebody um, with their research or even if you're just curious and you want to come see something um, make an appointment and come in so thank you very much and um, I look forward to seeing you in the special collections <laughs>